Welcome to the next webinar of the BHI Collaborative's Overcoming Obstacles Series, Sustaining Behavioral Health Care in Your Practice. This webinar is titled Deep Dive Practical Billing Strategies for the Collaborative Care Model. Before we get started, please note that this webinar is for informational purposes only. You should consult a professional advisor for specific medical, legal, financial, or other advice. If you have any questions or concerns, please send your inquiries to practice.sustainability at ama-assn.org. This series is a collaborative product of eight of the nation's leading professional physician organizations dedicated to equipping physicians and their practices with the necessary knowledge to sustain a whole person integrated an equitable approach to physical, mental, and behavioral health care during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. This webinar will take a deeper dive into effective billing and coding strategies specific to the collaborative care model. Our speakers will detail strategies for billing the collaborative care model codes and offer case examples of how such strategies work in practice. With that, I will turn the conversation over to AIM Center co-director, Dr. Anna Rasliff, and UPenn's Director of Primary Care Operations, Sebastian Haynes. All right, thank you. So uh, my name is uh, Dr. Anna Ratzliff. I'm really um, excited to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and start with a brief overview of the collaborative care model and basic billing information to set some context for diving into an actual case study where we'll take that deeper dive. Um, and at that time, when we go into the case study, I'm going to welcome Sebastian Haynes to contribute and tell us a little bit more about his practice uh, and how this billing approach has worked in the real world. Can we go ahead and go to the next slide? So I wanna just make sure we're setting the frame of what collaborative care is because we'll be talking about the collaborative care billing codes. And it's really important that you understand the key components of collaborative care since those are required to be able to build the collaborative care codes. So a collaborative care team is based on a primary care team. It takes advantage of that primary relationships between a primary care provider and the patient and really adds in two additional behavioral health providers to support that dyad. Uh, the first is is a behavioral health care manager um, or behavioral health care provider that is actually usually embedded in that practice. Uh, this is typically somebody that has a master's level um, uh, degree in social work, or it could be a nurse with behavioral skills training. They do two things to help the PCP. The first is really provide care management support to the whole team, facilitate communication, uh, track behavioral health measures uh, in a registry, uh, and also uh, make sure that we are regularly using behavioral health measures. They also coordinate in a weekly psychiatric case review with a psychiatric consultant. Uh, that psychiatric consultant typically doesn't see most of those patients in person, but rather provides their expertise through case reviews where they might make diagnostic assessment or treatment recommendations for the team to implement, uh, specifically that that primary care provider continues to be a prescriber, and then that behavioral health care manager also able to deliver evidence-based brief behavioral interventions. So that's really what collaborative care is, and I talked about a lot of the key um, components that we'll come back to as we get into the details of billing uh, throughout the rest of the webinar. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So uh, when collaborative care has a strong evidence base, over 80 randomized controlled trials that have shown this to be an effective treatment, and really out of those trials have come five core key components that need to be in place to really be the secret sauce that delivers those better outcomes that we've seen in those trials of collaborative care. And these are population-based care, the use of a registry to track all the patients that are identified and need to be supported, measurement-based treatment to target, so that concept of really taking behavioral health measures like a PHQ-9 and regularly assessing is the treatment of the team getting the job done, is the patient getting better, uh, patient-centered collaboration, again, a team really working together to deliver that care in a primary care or other medical setting, the use of a full range of evidence-based treatments, so that includes both medications and brief behavioral interventions, and then really holding some accountability, so having some good measures that you're going to look at your overall program and make sure that actually you're achieving the outcomes that you set out to um, do as you started your collaborative care team. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. 
All right, so that's a very whirlwind overview of collaborative care. We have lots of other materials um, that have been associated with this collaborative that go into more detail around uh, the collaborative care model. And I urge you, if you need to have more details about the model, to look at those. I'm going to now transition and talk a little bit about financial sustainability and some approaches that are important as you frame that approach. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so one of the things I like to start with is really saying if you're starting a new collaborative care program, you need to consider both the initial costs of practice change, what is it going to take to implement and start this, and then um, also have a plan for the ongoing care delivery costs. So I bucket those in two separate buckets because I think they are, are two discrete um, ex set of expenses that is really important to identify sources and resources for those. So some of the initial costs of practice change are you know, time for providers to set up all the workflows. This is a really different way of working together. Time to train your team um, and actually develop people to have new skills to work together in new ways. The development of a registry, and this is a particularly important cost to talk about, because especially if you're going to embed that in your electronic uh, medical record that can or health record, that can actually be quite a, a big lift. And maybe we can have Sebastian talk about that a little bit when we get into the case. Um, and then workflow planning and billing optimization. So really developing that financing plan and then actually having the resources of the team time to figure out all the, the nitty gritty details, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in a few minutes when we talk about the case. So that's really important to have uh, resources and an investment to do that. And then there are the ongoing delivery costs. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about those really now and, and what are the opportunities to actually build for the time of the care team working in this different way. Um, and particularly, this is important that you could hear in my description of collaborative care that there are a lot of non um, billable uh, minutes spent, you know, in care coordination and psychiatric case review and of the care manager and that the collaborative care codes that we'll talk about really offer a source of payment for that time spent on coordinating care um, that's complementary to the direct service delivery that the care managers um, participate in. And then we also want to talk about the psychiatric consultant time as a cost that needs to be covered. Um, as I said, most of that is not direct face-to-face -face care. So we need alternative mechanisms to capture uh, revenue to pay for that psychiatric consultant time. All right, we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide. Uh, and I guess I'll say this is a, an approach as you think about building your program, um, really think about what do you need to build a strong program that's going to deliver the kind of clinical outcomes that you hope to achieve. Um, then really think broadly about what the value is. I think many organizations find that in addition to the dollars and cents piece, which of is a, of course important. There are other values that this um, implementation brings and making sure you have a way to really capture that value um, as part of your implementation. So provider satisfaction, for example, can be a really important thing to pay attention to and, and might be a really important reason to continue a program, even if it um, might cost your overall system a little bit of resource to continue that program, right? So really important to think about that. Um, and then we encourage you to think about using a financial modeling tool to really try to understand, do we have a good structure set up to actually generate enough revenue to cover the way that we're building our program. So those are some key um, features that you might want to think about as you build your program. And let's go on to the next slide. Uh, there are several different ways that people have actually figured out how to pay for collaborative care. Again, some of the, these costs are new because there are different ways of working together. Um, I'll just highlight a few. There are some systems that are fully capitated and they just basically pay for collaborative care in that time because they feel like this is an important service to deliver as part of their overall care. Um, there are models of partially capitated programs. Sometimes these are state funded, for example, where maybe the PCP bills for fee for service, but the clinic receives some kind of uh, financing uh, support to actually provide the, the rest of the care management and psychiatric consultation. Um, there are some states that have also looked at case rate uh, models. So this would be basically every patient that was enrolled in collaborative care, a clinic would receive a certain amount of money to cover the costs of having a care manager and a psychiatric consultant. 
Um, there are some, you know, emerging models around value-based payment. I think this is still very early days around this, but um, where, you know, really there are payment incentives built in around delivering outcomes, and those are often to date around depression outcomes. So really meeting certain requirements about achieving a certain uh, um, response or remission rate of patients that are identified as having depression. And then finally, the place where most people are, which is some kind of direct billing to cover these services. And there are really two big buckets here. Um, traditional fee-for-service billing, where this would be, you could bill for any of the psychotherapy or direct assessment um, portions, or the use of new um, codes that were introduced by CMS in 2017 um, called the Collaborative Care Management Codes. And so we'll be spending a bunch of time talking about those in the next few slides. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and again, I just want to say, you know, as you think about how to, to really capture value, um, it's important to think about not only the, the dollars and cents and costs, but many of the other dimensions that your collaborative care team might bring to your system, um, you know, improved patient outcomes, improved patient experience, especially mental health care access. And I think that's something maybe, Sebastian, you can comment on a, a, as far as a motivation to your um, team when, when in just a minute, and then provider experience and cost effectiveness. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to quickly review these new collaborative care codes in the next couple of slides. Next slide. Uh, so this is, um, these are the actual code numbers. Um, these were, again, Medicare codes that were introduced in 2017 and have had some updates over time, um, especially the introduction of codes for FQHCs and RHCs in 2018. Um, what's listed on the slide here are the um, three collaborative care codes, which are those 99492, 99493, 99494 and a new code that was introduced this last year, G2214. Um, and these are really the ones that require you to actually deliver all the components of collaborative care to be able to build these codes. And in the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what those look like. Um, there are some other behavioral health integration codes that were also introduced at the same time. Um, listed on the slide is 99484. Um, that has a whole different set of requirements and we're not gonna focus on that as part of the rest of this presentation. Uh, so I wanna just say that if you're gonna build a collaborative care codes, you actually need to um, have active treatment and care management for an identified patient population. You need to be using regular tracking tool, for example, the PH9, um, be able to do proactive outcome monitoring and treatment to target. Uh, and you need to be using a registry to help facilitate regular systematic psychiatric caseload reviews. This doesn't necessarily mean you have to talk about every patient every week, but you need to be thinking about the whole caseload every week and identifying those patients that need to be discussed in that psychiatric case review. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, it's really important to understand a few key features of these codes. The whole payment actually goes to the primary care provider for these codes. So one of the important things that you actually have to figure out is how you're then going to pay for the team. Um, so I'll just acknowledge that there is some need to actually think about how you're going to share that payment to cover the cost of the care manager and the psychiatric consultant. There are different models of this. Um, for example, some practices pay that psychiatrist sort of for a period of time. Um, other people just directly hire someone to actually um, serve in this role. Um, you might partner with your be a behavioral health organization. So there are a bunch of different structures, um, but one of the important things is actually coming up with a plan for how you're gonna then divide up that revenue to, to sort of cover all those services. So that's a really important thing to think about. Um, you bill on a per patient um, basis for those that meet the established time thresholds in terms of numbers of minutes. And those are um, minutes that the behavioral health care manager spends delivering care. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, the psychiatrist does not bill separately, um, but actually needs to, again, have some kind of contract or relationship with that primary care practice. Um, these codes do require for Medicare a general consent for the service and um, the acknowledgement that they may incur a cost share or copay, um, which is really important. And I think, again, uh, it'll be nice to hear as we go through the case, the real world experience around that discussion. It's, a, it's an important part of implementing the codes. 
Um, interactions don't have to be face to face. And this has been particularly important in the last, you know, 15, 18 months as we've been in the middle of a pandemic and the fact that you could actually quickly pivot and deliver a lot of that care via tele or even telephone has been a real advantage if you already are um, billing for collaborative care. And then um, you can also bill additional codes. So if you do do a, additional direct service, for example, some programs have the capacity to have that uh, patient actually seen by a psychiatric consultant, you can go ahead and bill for that service um, in the traditional fee-for-service strategies. And then I just, I won't spend a lot of time talking about FQHCs and RHCs, but I just wanna acknowledge that there are some specific components and complexities to billing there that are worth reading through carefully the um, codes to be able to do that. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the time again is care manager time and it's over the course of a calendar month. So we'll talk a little bit about the complexities that that brings into billing when we, when we go through the case. Um, these codes um, follow the CPT time rule, which means that once you've met 50% plus one minute of the time, you can then bill that code. So really every minute counts when you're actually thinking about the collaborative care codes and, and finding mechanisms to track that is very important. Um, and then you do have an additional code. So if you um, have a patient that needs a lot of attention in a particular month, there is a way to capture revenue to, to cover that, that um, cost. Um, and then uh, I'll just note, we're not spending a lot of time on the um, behavioral health, the general behavioral health integration code, but that does not follow <laughs> the time rule and you actually need to do a full 20 minutes. So just making sure people are aware of that. And then again, the FQHCs and RHCs um, also require you to meet the full 70 or 60 minute time threshold. So those are, again, a different set of codes that are, are worth um, spending some specific time learning about if you wanna use them in your practice. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. All right, valuation payment. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, we just want to say that, you know, these codes were initially introduced by CMS um, and uh, Medicare, but we have seen um, that actually they're now expanding beyond that initial um, introduction. So we are seeing both Medicare traditional fee-for-service as well as Medicare Advantage plans paying these codes. Um, we are seeing some payment for FQHCs and RHCs, which I've already mentioned. And then increasingly, we are seeing states adopt these codes to be paid um, and be able to be paid by Medicaid. And this is a current list as of July, 2021. Um, you can see that some states are fully gone already and, and done this and other states are either having limited or delayed implementation um, of these codes. It's really important um, to, to know if you have a large uh, number of uh, in your pair mix of Medicaid patients, what that looks like in your state. Uh, and so the uh, American Psychiatric Association does have um, a list on their website, which I'll show the, the link to the website at the end that actually um, allows you to look at these um, codes and know a little bit more about which states are um, currently um, reimbursing through Medicaid. Let's go ahead to the next slide. There are also a number of commercial plans. So this, um, you can't just ask, oh, who in the whole country is actually doing this? It's actually requires a lot of work and um, maybe we can talk a little bit about this. Uh, essentially, these are listed, uh, a list of commercial plans that we have been reported to us as paying these codes through various um, connections that we've had out in the community. It is not a comprehensive list. So there may be many other plans that are actually uh, reimbursing these codes and you just really need to actually um, talk to your payer mix about whether or not these codes are reimbursable through the plans that um, you, you are contracted with them. So we, we put this up as an example of some of the plans that we've heard of. And um, I would love for Sebastian to talk a little bit about this when he talks about his program in a, in a minute. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so we're going to dive into a case. And what I want to do is actually um, start by letting Sebastian um, introduce himself a little bit more and his practice, and then we'll go through the case. I'm going to kind of give the generic like uh, scenario, and then I'd love to hear kind of the real world perspective on how some of these um, big picture uh, aspects of the, the billing requirements get put in place. So why don't we um, hear a little bit from you, Sebastian, about your practice. Thanks, Dr. Ratzliff. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sebastian Haynes. I'm, as, a, as introduced, a director of program operations with Penn Medicine's primary care service line. 
as part of that responsibility, as part of that position, I'm responsible for our integrated mental health program called Penn Integrated Care. Uh, we launched in 2018, largely um, as a result of most of our primary care practices joining CPC Plus, um, which was a Medicare payment innovation program for primary care. Um, we started in six practices uh, in our Philadelphia area that had an active patient population, probably around 70 to 80,000 patients. So they were our large academic sites with some of our um, smaller um, practices that were not academic. I think since 2018, we've actually expanded to 12 practices. Um, from 2018 until now, we've had a little over 28,000 referrals, um, and those practices are now covering about 120,000 active patients. Um, I think something we found very early on is that payer coverage was spotty, as Dr. Ratzliff mentioned, and so even with our commercial payers or our Medicare Advantage plans, we had to uh, contact payers individually um, to determine coverage for specific codes, whether they were included as part of a capitated payment or paid separately, um, or negotiate coverage in, in the case that the code was not covered at all. I think since that time, we've actually been able to negotiate coverage for almost 98% of our insurance products that are seen in our primary care practices, which has certainly made um, implementation and expansion a lot easier. I think currently we are um, in the middle of expanding to the rest of uh, our primary care practices and hope to be in 22 or 23 sites by the end of this next fiscal year. Great, thank you so much. And I think hearing that real world experience around that you actually had to go out and really have those conversations with your payers, I think is a really important uh, take home point for practices who might be thinking about um, moving in this direction. So what we're gonna do is actually walk through a, an actual patient scenario. And we did this, we created this resource um, pretty early on in our support of trying to figure out how to help practices really implement the use of these new codes because because um, people were, I think, really struggling to conceptualize, like, how does it actually work over a course of treatment for, for a care uh, of care for a patient? So we're going to use an exemplar scenario. I'm going to kind of walk through what a month of treatment might look like and how a practice might capture or document the um, revenue or the, and the work for, for that um, patient care. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm going to introduce a patient. Um, this is a uh, not a real patient, but based on sort of um, my experience uh, working as a psychiatric consultant and a, the type of patient we typically could take care of as part of uh, a collaborative care program. Um, it's a patient that comes in to see their PCP uh, and really presents, and you can read the scenario here, with feeling like um, he has fatigue um, and some symptoms that are very consistent with what a patient that presents with depression looks like. Uh, also, you know, this is um, in the context of medical conditions like chronic back pain, and this is very common of the kind of patient that we can actually help and serve. Um, and he uh, really um, feels uh, distressed. Uh, what's really great about this, you can see in this case, is that the PCP right there that day can go ahead and administer a behavioral health measure. So in this case, a PHQ-9, um, which actually scores high. So just so people know, a score of a 10 or more is really um, thought to be important um, to, to do some additional assessment around. Um, that PCP has had some training and so knows to ask about suicidality um, and really finds out that um, Mr. A is not actively suicidal, but that he, uh, and, and actually has never even really thought of himself as depressed before. Um, and that the primary care provider really does an important thing here, which is expresses confidence that he can get better from this. And, and I think the PCP feels empowered to do that because they have services right there where they're actually gonna be able to support that patient uh, and can actually that day sometimes even introduce the behavioral um, healthcare manager um, also can engage them in a consent to, to treatment, which the PCP needs to do that initial conversation. Um, so I do just want to say that, the, you know, this is kind of an idealized situation and maybe we can hear a little bit. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, in this case, um, this presenting uh, patient is, is really is going to be built through the traditional uh, mechanisms for that 
PCP's time. So these minutes don't count towards the um, collaborative care code. So what we're going to do after each little piece of scenario is show you a table like this, uh, which will show the date, um, what happened, sort of where the billing um, or revenue might be captured for that particular um, type of care. So you can see in this case, that would be regular e &M billing that that PCP would do. Um, we'll talk a little bit about are there any billable minutes that could be um, captured through uh, fee-for-service um, work um, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the team does. And then, of course, um, what would the COCM or collaborative care minutes um, look like if you were capturing those? So we'll, we'll go through this. You'll see this uh, basic structure throughout the rest of the case presentation. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, so the behavioral health care manager sees Mr. A for a warm handoff visit to engage Mr. A and schedule a time for a full intake in the future. Um, and the patient is entered into the registry, so they now are a patient that's been identified as needing treatment. Um, so I'd love to have um, uh, Sebastian comment a little bit on uh, how this actually looks in, in your practice setting. Thanks, Dr. Ratzliff. So I think something every practice will need to decide is how do they want referrals to actually happen? We used a mixed approach. So for non-urgent patients, a uh, physician will enter kind of a consult to our program. We have a centralized group of intake coordinators who will reach out to the patient and assess. But for urgent patients um, who it's really a critical safety concern, they'll do a direct warm handoff to the behavioral health care manager. I think the process is... Um, pretty important depending on which way we go. For patients who are not urgent, uh, the PCP will do kind of the general consent. Are you okay with me referring to the program? But then our resource center, when they reach out to the patient, will actually do a much more in-depth kind of re-consent where they'll explain that these patients, uh, that these services are time-based, that they are um, would count towards a patient's deductible, that a patient may have co-insurance. I think early on, when we were billing these codes, it wasn't quite clear to the patient when we actually dropped the charge what the services were for, because there's oftentimes a delay from when they consent, when they have that first visit to the PCP, to when they actually would receive a bill maybe a month or a month and a half later after all the services have been delivered. I think another challenge we found, particularly with warm handoffs, is it's very hard to consent a patient in crisis in the moment. And so, this is something we're admittedly still working through where I think we take care of the patient first. I think once the patient's stabilized, um, we'll then kind of do a brief consent and depending on the outcome, whether they'll be seen in the practice or referred to specialty care, we'll go through a more in-depth consent with the patient at that time as well. Yeah, so I think that's really helpful to hear, like in the real world, it's a little messier, right? So, I mean, I think that um, actually working through having some scripts for your PCPs on what they need to say to actually do the consent can be really helpful. Um, having those additional resources or that additional person who can go into more detail, because I think often patients have questions about their plan and their deductible um, and making sure that you have uh, anticipated that and have some support for that in your practice can be really helpful as you're implementing these codes. Great, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so just so we, you know, we can kind of capture that, um, in this particular case, that warm handoff could be a 15 minute visit um, that the care manager might have had uh, either with direct face-to-face, -face, uh, either in person or via tele, um, and maybe five minutes of registry time, kind of entering this patient into the registry, documenting maybe the um, behavioral health measure. Um, so this is 20 minutes of collaborative care time in, you know, an actual billable time, um, you, you know, you can actually have uh, 20 minutes towards collaborative care in this case. Um, so that's actually really helpful. Uh, there wouldn't be anything that would actually be able to be billed in this scenario by, you know, more traditional fee for, uh, typically a fee for service kind of approach. Um, I'm curious if you, how you guys approach that for your practice, Sebastian. Yeah, so for our practices, and I, I think really want to heart kind of focus on the importance of the registry and building in the right metrics that you want to track because it really helped improve our billing processes. And so we built a lot of the capability to document minutes and triage outcomes into the registry so we could then build reports that pulled that information back at the end of the month. In this particular case, I think if the behavioral health care manager um, 
assess the patient in the warm handoff, we're able to get the consent, we likely would bill, and they're a good candidate for collaborative care, and there weren't any other services throughout the month, we would likely bill the G2214 code um, because it kind of falls into the 30 minute threshold, but is above the 50% plus one minute threshold for the code. If they're assessed and they're determined a good candidate for specialty mental health care, we all have a triage disposition of kind of specialty care. And at that point, we would build the 99484 code for kind of BHI intervention. Yeah, I think that's a really good example of how you might have um, bifurcations of your treatment sort of pathway, and those might result in different billing codes. And that still allows you to capture some of that um, some reimbursement for that time that the care manager is spending engaging that patient and actually helping them get to the right level of care. So that's, that's great. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to kind of continue the case and uh, you'll note the date and I didn't talk about this, but collaborative care minutes accrue over um, a calendar month. And so if this patient had presented late in the month and that was maybe all you could do during that month, I think that's a really good example of where you might capture that revenue through that um, the G code. And, and, you know, if it's earlier in the month, there might be some opportunity to uh, engage the patient in an additional um, care and that would allow additional minutes to accrue. So you'll see that sort of over the case, but I just wanted to highlight the date. Um, so in this particular case, the the patient came back to do a more complete assessment. And this is pretty common because oftentimes that warm handoff isn't enough time to do a complete assessment. Um, in our particular, most of the programs we um, work with, they help set up to have really a nice comprehensive sort of primary care centric assessment. So uh, this may not look exactly like what a, a specialty mental health assessment would look like, but it does include key, you know, diagnostic categories assessing, for example, if a patient's presenting with depression symptoms for bipolar disorder, assessing for um, substance use disorders, um, also thinking about um, if there are other um, conditions that need to be considered. In this particular case, we're going to have a pretty straightforward case of major depressive disorder because I think that makes it nice and simple for us to look through the rest of the case. Um, and that, that, that this is really an opportunity to provide a lot of psychoeducation also integrated into that assessment. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so in this case, you could actually then um, have a choice in what might be billable if you were going to try to bill for that behavioral health care manager's time. Um, if they were credentialed and um, actually um, on the list for all of your potential payers, which I'm going to ask Sebastian to, to comment on in a minute, um, you might be able to actually bill a traditional fee for service um, 90791 assessment um, for that time. Um, and record five minutes towards the collaborative care codes, or you could attribute that whole 50 minutes of time towards the collaborative care code. So this is one of those places where you start to have choices in your billing. Um, practices really have to decide, are they gonna do a hybrid model and bill both of these services? Are they gonna only bill traditional sort of fee for service? Are they gonna only bill collaborative care? And I think people always ask, what should they do? And I think it really depends on the practice. The most important thing is that you're not double counting minutes. So um, if you're gonna do a hybrid model, you have to have really good accounting mechanisms and really clear guidance for your providers. Love to hear about how that's worked at Penn. Yeah, great, great question. So early on, we actually made the decision to only look at collaborative care documentation or billing opportunities. Part of that is because we would have had to um, credential a lot of our primary care sites in order to see kind of behavioral health services. So we were only um, credentialed as primary care locations. I, I think the second piece of it is particularly for our health systems insurance network, we're out of network with a lot of our major payers in the area. We have a very small psychiatry department and so did not have really the contracting um, support in order to take a lot of patients to the normal fee-for-service mental health billing arena. Great, thanks. I think it's helpful to hear you know, that how you may came to the decision that your practice did. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to kind of fast forward a bit in the case, um, you know, the patient also comes back and sees the PCP um, during this, this time, um, and that, that visit uh, traditionally in this particular case, the patient might be started on a medication, for example, um, you might actually 
um, think about, you know, traditionally the primary care provider um, uh, time is, is again, built totally separately and we'll show that in the next slide. Um, the psychiatric consultant might even be available to help support that primary care provider. Again, um, none of that psychiatric consultant time is directly recorded unless the behavioral health care manager is in, involved in that a conversation. Um, but the behavioral health care manager often visits with that patient and may um, have another brief session with them later in the month. And this is pretty typical. Um, one of the real advantages of collaborative care is to have that early engagement. And they can't even start, for example, evidence-based psychotherapies, in this case, for this patient, problem-solving therapy. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I'd love to have um, Sebastian comment a little bit more on how this looks in, in your practice. Yeah, I, I think one of the early planning activities we did is we broke out a lot of the different tasks that would occur in collaborative care and identified whether it would be billable or not billable. And then we came up with time estimations. So there was kind of, we actually tracked a few staff with a stopwatch just to get a sample size, say how, how long on average does this take? And so we came up with a general guide and things like leaving voicemails. If you're not interacting with the patients, we would say that's clerical, don't count that toward the billable total. But if you're working, doing care coordination with the psychiatrist and the PCP doing care planning, that that could be billable, but you would only count the time like as one, you wouldn't add up the time from all three members that are participating in the team. So I think really having the ability to train your staff on how to document minutes is important. And I really like that idea that you actually created kind of some guidance so that everybody, there was some consistency across your practice. Similar clinical activities should be built for sort of this or attributed the same similar amounts of time. So that's really helpful. And you can see again that you start getting to have some choices. If you're building collaborative care codes, you might be able to capture more of that behavioral health care manager's time. Um, if, you're, if you're not, there might be some of that time that gets kind of left on the table for, for lack of a better word. All right, let's go on. And we're going to finish the last little part of this case. Um, so, you know, the rest of the month care continues. You know, there might be times when the team has to coordinate care, like on September 15th. Um, 17th, the PCP might see the patient back for follow up or, you know, maybe manage some of that through a portal. Um, and then the care manager also uh, might do, for example, a telephone visit. And that's another advantage of the collaborative care model is that, you know, care can be delivered through lots of different modality because it's really the time, not the modality that that um, determines whether that care is is captured in the minutes. So let's go ahead to the last uh, table here. All right, so again, you know, this kind of outlines a few of the examples of the kinds of activities and how you might attribute them. Do you want to comment on, on any um, uh, ways that you guys think about what time counts towards what in your practice? Yeah, so, so I think this is a, I think this is where the fun starts when we actually uh, bill, kind of bill the claims at the end of the month and um, we'll, will identify kind of which activities were billable. We actually have a billing report that um, lists all the activities that happened with the patient at the end of the month. And we'll determine which encounters were billable, we'll total the time, and we'll actually enter the charges and do a visit on the patient's account. Yeah, so if we go to the next slide, you can see that if you're actually, um, for example, doing that, you can um, look at that. And there's lots of different ways you could do this. It sounds like in your practice, you're doing only um, collaborative care um, billing. So you would really focus um, on adding up the total number of minutes and then attributing the right collaborative care codes, depending on whether this was the first month of treatment, a subsequent month of treatment, and then how much total time accrued over that month. And that, of course, is a calendar month. So I hear one of the things you're saying is you sort of get that report, and then that way you can actually actually go through and assign the right level of billing at the end of the month. Yeah, I think the other key pieces that we look for in this, we have a very conservative billing compliance group, but we ensure that the PCP has been involved in the care, so they're looped in since we're billing under their NPI. We also ensure that there's been some type of acknowledgement that the psychiatrist has reviewed the chart over the course of the month. And we look at whether the order, I think, was has been within the last six months, and we look at whether um, they've had any billable collaborative care activity before. So dependent on if they've had a 99492 dropped as a new patient, we might bill a follow-up uh, visit depending on what charges we've entered historically. 
Yeah, I think that's really helpful to it. It does take some really, it sounds like coordinated work with your mm -hmm. financing and compliance people to really make sure you have a good plan of what are all the boxes that need to be ticked yeah. to be able to actually build that code since there are a bunch of components that need to be in place to be in compliance with the the um, the way the codes are, are outlined. So that's really helpful to hear how that works in the real world. All right. Well, I think we're going to go on and just share a few resources. And I just thank you so much for um, sharing your real world experience. Um, so um, if you're getting inspired, there's lots of resources out there to help you. And this was basically an introduction. If you go on to the next slide. Um, one of the big things I want to say is we can't possibly answer all of your questions in this particular recording. So um, there are uh, billing and financing office hours that the American Psychiatric Associations and the center that I co-direct, the AIM Center, offer monthly. And these are on the first Wednesday of the month um, from noon to 1 Eastern time. And you can um, get information on the AIM Center website, which I'll have the link in, uh, in, uh, in the couple of slides. Um, and then we also have implementation office hours. So if you're also new to collaborative care, this is another place that you can bring questions. I host the ones that are the billing and financial sustainability calls. And every month I learn and practices are trying things and have nice workflows to share just like Sebastian did with us here today. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we also have the American Psychiatric Association has um, curated a whole list of resources, um, and those are located on um, their website. Um, there's also, um, these are some of the a um, AIM Center websites. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so this is the AIM Center website, um, the billing and financing office hours, and that financial modeling workbook. All right, let's go to the last slide. And um, I think there are a whole bunch of additional webinars that have much more detail on some of the things that I only provided a brief overview. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand this back to Margo to conclude today's webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Breslin and Sebastian for sharing your amazing experience and, ex and expertise with our viewers. Be sure and look, visit our series page on the AMA website for more information on up upcoming webinars. You can also access previous recordings on our YouTube playlist. And there is a list of the previous ones there. Please also check out the collaborative resource, the BHI Compendium for a helpful framework on how you can make BHI effective in your practice. Thank you again.